Hey, how's it going? This is Joe and Tell. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the Totem Kin play. But before we get started, I want to thank the people on Patreon for supporting my channel. So if you're interested in listening to my podcast or other behind the scenes, take a look at patreon.com forward slash Joe and Tell. You want to know how it compares? Is it worth it? What's the frequency response like? Yeah, I get it. I've used these for a while. I had them in my main system. So I have a good idea what they sound like. What do we have here? One inch metal alloy dome tweeter, five inch natural hybrid woofer, two times 120 watts RMS. So yeah, these are active speakers. Bluetooth 4.1, stereo RCA, and you can switch between phono and line level. Digital input is optical. It has a subwoofer output. It has a remote control. It comes with this crazy speaker wire. It can sample up to 48 kilohertz via Bluetooth. The optical in sampling rate is 192, 24 bit. Dimensions are seven inches by about 14 inches by 9.25 inches deep. They are 15 pounds for the active one and 12 pounds for the passive. Look at this, break in time is recommended 50 to 100 hours. And I did put in those hours. So that's why it took me a while to actually even review these because I had them playing in my main system for a long time so no one could say, hey, you didn't break them in. So there you have it. Um, they come in satin black and satin white and it has a magnetic grill cover. So you have your knob here in the front, IR, and this remote is kind of funny. It's thin, but it has some weight to it. Not my favorite, you know, small buttons. It's not something where I could tell exactly where I'm at. It's not like these light up or anything, right? So if it's dark, it's gonna be hard to see any of this stuff. Anyway, let's take a look at the back. <sighs> they are 15 pounds, they're heavy. Let me just kind of show you the back here. Rear port and then the RCAs and you can switch them from phono to line. So this is cool because if you have a turntable and you wanna connect it to this, well, you don't need a phono preamp, right? You can just plug in directly here and switch it to phono and you're good to go. So far, I haven't had any issues with this. I think it sounds all right. You have your ground, subwoofer output. I was curious as to whether connecting the sub would apply a high pass to the speakers and the answer is no. Okay, uh, optical in and then yeah, the plugs, power on and off, nice plate app on there. And the finish on this is good. So if I go to their website and I hit buy, the price is a thousand bucks. These are a thousand bucks for a pair. Yeah, so, you know, this is the first totem acoustic speaker that I've ever gotten a chance to listen to. And I've heard a lot of my, you know, a lot of my friends who would consider themselves audiophiles, they've always talked about totem acoustics, totem acoustics. It's like, you know, it's not a huge company and it's not something you could, you're you gonna find at Best Buy or anything like that. But they would, they would rave about these. And I was kind of curious as to like, you know, what it is, what's so special about these? What do they do that makes them so special that these guys talk about it so much, right? Maybe they're just weird, but yeah, they're a thousand bucks a pair. So not the most expensive speakers, you know, um, they're up there. I've reviewed ELAC, the Navis, those were 2000, two Gs. So these are half of that. And I guess I'm gonna have to tell you how they sound in comparison. You wanna know how the imaging is? Well, the imaging on these I think is very good. So like I said, I got these around the same time as I got the Vanatu Transparent One Encores. I got them at the same time, I unboxed them at the same time, and I listened to them around the same time. And so a few things they have in common, they both have five inch drivers, they both have one inch aluminum dome tweeters. This one is a larger speaker. Where on my video on the Vanatus, I said that the Vanatus sounded awesome at a desk, but in my, in my living room, I felt like I wanted the sweet spot to be wider. And the reason I said that, and I was so sure about it, is because when I played these, the thing I noticed was that it did have a really, really wide sweet spot. It didn't have to be in that one spot. I could move around a little bit and it would sound good in all those spots. So that's one of the things I noticed about this. It did have a wider sweet spot. It had good imaging. The sound stage was wide. I mean, I don't have the perfect living room, so I can't say I would like a chance to try this in different locations. All right, are they 10 times better than the Mica RB42? That's a good question. I would say that these are in a different category 
altogether than RB42s just simply because these are active. So these have a lot of things going for it when it comes to just plug and play. You know, you can Bluetooth to this. You can plug in, a, as I said, a turntable directly to these. You can plug in your phone directly to these. The way I actually have them hooked up is I have a Chromecast audio going to the back via optical. And so I stream to the Chromecast audio. So I have the high res file going into these wirelessly. Boom, set. Uh, this also does have an auto sleep feature. I wish I had a, a, a way to change the setting on that because I do notice like I wake up in the morning, I wanna play some music to these and I have to always turn it on. One small thing, but as far as sound though, so the RB42s are what, 129 bucks? I think it would be a fair comparison if I took off all of the active components, right? So if I said this as a passive speaker versus the mic RB42, surprisingly, I think they would have very similar bass response. I'd have to hear them side by side, but the micas could possibly have a little bit more bass even. I don't know, I'd have to hear them side by side, but these get these can get very loud, right? These can get like, I would say as loud as the SVS Ultras. S Prime, no, SVS Prime, yeah, S SVS Prime bookshelf and the Ultras, they both get pretty loud and these get really loud too. And I think I know why that is. I did a bunch of measurements. I did on axis, off axis to see how off axis performance was excellent. I uh, made sure to test the frequency response of the port because you're supposed to sum those, right? Uh, the port does extend the bass response. So if I only did from the front and I didn't account for the back, then that's not really fair. So I did account for all of those things. Do you know the make of the drivers? You know what? I do not, but this is a different, you know, different material than I'm used to. Very lightweight. Um, I would say that it doesn't feel as stiff as some of the other materials like aluminum, uh, maybe some kind of treated paper, you know, on their website, they're pretty vague about it. So Carl Smith says, I bet they're not as loud as my Klipsch 160 M's. I don't know. I heard the Klipsch are, have a high sensitivity, but I don't know. I haven't heard them. Thomas and Stereo says, do you find them too bright? What's up, Thomas and Stereo? I know you reviewed these and you said that at first you found them bright until you broke them in. And then afterwards, I guess you said that they were, you kind of got used to them or they broke in or something where, where you could listen to them with the grill off. Right, and that's one thing I remember hearing you say. Thomas, you don't do a ton of measurements and you know I'm that guy, I like to do measurements. But what I would say is what you're describing shows up perfectly in the measurements. That's why I like to do them because I can either describe them to you or I can just show you and maybe what I'm hoping to do is eventually teach people how to read these graphs so they can see for themselves like, all right, I see what that looks like. Now I have a general idea how those might sound because I'm not the best with words when it comes to describing stuff. I don't have any flowery words to say. I'm just a straight up guy. You know, if somebody asks me about these, I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're cool. Yeah, they're cool. They, this is what they do and that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm not great at describing stuff, but I can show you a graph. So here is the frequency response in room. If you're not used to seeing this graph, this is the low end, right? This is the base. This is like mid base area here, right? Mid range and then upper, like vocals are still around here. And then you get into the high frequencies, right? And so Thomas and Stereo said, hey, these sound kind of bright to me. Now take a look at what happens from my measurement. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. This is from my measurement in room. Is it, I am not in an anechoic chamber. So this is just what I, what I was able to measure. But look what happens after 7K, right? After seven kilohertz, these are the higher frequencies. So it starts to rise. And then after, what is this? After 13K, this goes up from 87 dB all the way up to 92, right? So that's five dB up. So the peak at 16 kilohertz. So that's kind of funny because that is the, you know, that is very high. A lot of people can't even hear past like, 14 kilohertz. So the fact that they would choose to have this rise above here over 14 kilohertz is kind of interesting, right? I think that's like the area where somebody who would be good at describing speakers would say, yeah, they're, you know, you got that air. Yeah, it's, you can, you can tell that it's there if you can hear past 14K. I have a feeling that even if you cannot, you might be able to 
kind of sense something different about these speakers. So that's the first thing is that rising response. So let's say this is the baseline at 85, right? Here, here's 85 decibels. And then after seven kilohertz, it starts to rise slowly, gradually. And then after 13 kilohertz, boom, big bump. Okay. Now, another thing that's very interesting about these, let me bring up the port here. Uh, so this is my measurement of the port in blue, right? So you can see that it does extend the base out further. Let me just take off the port for a second. Notice what happens here. So it's flat, 85 decibels is our, our reference level, right? Now at 200 Hertz, right? That's pretty high up. That's like, that's, that's, that's not low, low base, right? What ends up happening is it starts to, to decrease, right? It starts to fall off slowly, not, not a sharp decrease. It's not like, boom, it doesn't fall off, but it gradually decreases slowly, 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 which is really weird, right? If you look at that, you're going to say like, that doesn't have base. If that's happening, you have no base. And keep in mind that these are with the settings flat, right? They do have tone controls, but this is with everything flat. And then here's what happens with the port, right? So the port kicks in around 80 Hertz, it bumps up and then that gradually falls off. So the F3 with the port is at 56.3 Hertz, not super low base, but let's say F10, right? Which is like, you could barely hear the base, but F10 at about 40 Hertz, which is what they claim on their website. But that's, you know, I don't like an F10 being the number that they quote, but that's what they quote in room. Very weird response. Very, very weird. I haven't seen anything like that, but maybe, maybe that's why people like these totems. That doesn't look like a good frequency response, right? And people always say, you know, trust your ears. And I get why people say that, because if you like the way that those sound, who cares what the graph says? The only reason I like to look at the graph is because it tells me what's actually going on. If we, if you understand what that means, then it means that we can communicate easier, right? We can say, well, this is what's happening in the base response. And if you have experience, you'll know what that possibly sounds like, right? You might understand how that might sound in your room based on other speakers that have the same frequency response, right? No wonder I need to listen with minus one treble setting. Um, and in a fully treated room, Thomas. So you know what? I do the same exact thing. That's what's funny about, you know, this audio game, right? Even though I'm the guy who likes to measure and do all that. And Thomas, you're more a guy who just wants to listen. The funny thing is, here's, here's the funny thing. I keep mine at minus one treble too. To me, that's the setting that seems to work the best. So isn't that funny that we come to the same conclusion? So even though these don't look great on the graph, Totem has been around for a while and I think that they know what they're doing. I don't think that that frequency response is an accident. And I don't think it's because they don't want it like that. I think that they chose that response on purpose. And if I were to guess, other totem acoustic speakers would have similar characteristics. So for example, that bass response, right? Why is it, why does it slowly like, why does it taper off like that? And what I think is happening is they understand that most people are not going to put these in the best place. They're probably going to put it with a port too close to the wall, in which case the base is going to couple with the wall and you're going to typically have boomy base. But if they taper it off from 200 Hertz down, I think that they understand that that's going to compensate for any of the room gain with the base response. What about that, that tilted up treble? What is that all about? Honestly, that's the opposite of the type of sound that I typically go for, right? I like a more laid back sound. Elac makes speakers that are more laid back. But when you hear these, they sound, I want to say they give you a hi-fi sound, right? It's like a lot of times you'll go into the hi-fi shows and you'll check out some of the rooms and they just sound like so like crisp, like, ooh, I, I hear stuff I didn't hear in my other recordings. And of course that will happen when you mess with a frequency response and you turn the treble up, you know, 5 dB up that's gonna give you a sense of error. It's hard to pinpoint. Without that graph, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly why I'd be able to say that they're bright. Where, you know? I think it's very different to have the bump at 16 kilohertz and up versus having the, bu the bump at, you know, starting at, at five kilohertz, right? That's gonna be totally, a totally different sound. And I think if it was that low, people would complain. Yeah, I think they know exactly what they're doing. It's a very interesting response. It's not a V shape. It's not, you know, it's not anything that I've typically seen, 
So I like that. I like that. Yeah, when I first heard these, I thought that the bass was actually very good. I think I got more bass out of these than the Vanitus. And if you notice, everybody says that the Vanitus have very good bass for their size. Now, these are much bigger, so I would expect them to have much more bass. But I still was impressed with the output. And so I would say that these do not sound boomy. The bass extends far enough where I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain. Plus, it has tone controls. So if you want to bump up that bass a little bit more, feel free. Here's another thing I've noticed about these is that it does have the bass and treble controls, but nowhere on here does it say where I'm at. So there are eight steps in total, right? So if you're in neutral, you can go four up and then you can go four down. But I never know when I'm in the middle. I only know when I'm at the very bottom. So I kind of have to count from either the top or bottom, right? So if I go to the top, I can say, okay, I'm at the very top, it flashed. I can say one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I'm at minus one. Just nitpicking, but things that you'll notice on day-to-day on -day use and for a thousand dollar pair of speakers, I kind of want those those little details. And that's the thing I noticed about the Vanitus. They've thought of all those little tiny details. I don't, I wish I could just only say good things about a product, but that wouldn't be fair to you guys, right? You want to, you, you want to hear what I really think about these. And so, you know, sometimes I do have to bring in Jay to let you know what's going on with these and other speakers as well. But you know what? I actually, I haven't given a summary of these, but I kind of like these, you know, they're the opposite of what I typically like. I like a flat response, more laid back. Um, I do like aluminum though tweeters. I feel like they resolve a lot of detail. I just, I think I like these. I like the way these sound and I like the way they look too. They're like slim. Yeah, I like them. All right, so here we are at the speaker leaderboard and let's see where the totem kin plays land. And so we have powered speakers, ELAC, the Vanitus, the Dynas, Fluence. I would have to say that the totems are gonna have to be Huh, powered speakers, I'm gonna have to put them under the Dynas. They also fit into the bookshelf category. So we have the Dentons, Navis, Ultra Bookshelf, the UB5s. Mm, I think I will also put them right under the Dynas here. Best for desktop. It's gonna depend on whether you like bass or whether you like that that treble response on these, um, I'll go ahead and put them above the Dynas on best for desktop, just because I feel like for most people, the feature set, the fact that you can Bluetooth to them and it has a remote, all those things add up to make it a better speaker for the desktop for best under a thousand dollars. So these are right at a thousand. Um, I'm going to have to put these, let's see here, right, hmm, right below the transparent one encores. I feel like the, the T1Es are such a great value for their price. And there's just a lot of thought that has been put into them. Um, I just feel like it's more refined than the totems as far as the, the feature set, you know? And last but not least, let's see where the Kins plays land as far as best overall sound quality, regardless of price. So we have the Denton 85th, the e Elac Navis ARB 51, SVS Ultra Bookshelf. So we also have the Wharfdale Crystal 4.3s and the Dynas Vanitu Transparent 1 Encores. Sound quality wise, I would say they're below the Dynas but above the Vanitus in a larger room. There you have it. How about the near field desk setup capability of these bookshelves? Um, I think these are good near field. Practicality wise, I'd say they're a little bit big for the desk, but sound wise, they sound excellent. Kef LSX. All right, so again, I I don't have the LSX, but I think Thomas, Thomas and Stereo, he has them. I think he might've mentioned that in his review of these how these compared to the LSX. The LSX are tiny though. If you've ever seen them in person, they're like this tall, right? They're like more the size of the Vanitus. 
So I would expect this to have more output as far as bass response and volume. But, you know, I haven't heard them, so I can't tell you. I see, I see Thomas, though. I see you over there. Since you're in here, I see you upping your game, man. I see you upping your video game, having some B-roll and stuff like that. You know, you know, trying to creep up on me. I see you. <laughs> you know what I'm going to try to do, Thomas? I'll tell you right now. You're trying to increase your production value. I think my goal right now is I'm going to try to decrease. You know, I'm going to see how low I could go. <laughs> I think we're done here. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. Take care.